Well, glory to God. Pastor Callis, come on up here. Pastor Callis has been our Marshallese pastor here for how many years? How many? 13 years. And um, where are you, Brother Chinta? Are you here? Come on up. Brother Chinta is going to be taking Pastor Callis's place. You're moving to Enid. Going to work with Pastor Dotson and Enid. He's going to make you work hard. You know that, don't you? Hey, we want to take a moment to pray for him. You know, one of the things that God's committed our church to is to reach every culture with their heart language. I mean, many know English, but there's that heart language that communicates on a deeper level. So we have Spanish ministries, we have Slavic ministries, we have, we have all kinds, Marshallese ministries. We're trying to open in Dallas Indian ministries and Telugu and Tamil and all these other languages and Portuguese ministries. And you say, why would you do that? It's because God made so many different kinds of people. You look around you, almost every ethnic group on Maui is represented in this house. And that's by design, the design of the Lord. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. And so I'm going to ask you to join me as we pray. Pastors, would you come gather around? And ministers, come as well. Let's gather around Pastor Callis. You know, uh, he lost his wife recently. And... Uh, but he's moving on in God, and I thank you for that, Pastor Callis. Thank you for the labors of love that you gave to all of us. Stand with me. Would you reach your hands out to him? And let's agree together in prayer. Father, I thank you for Pastor Callis. I thank you for the privilege you've given us all to be blessed by his ministry. I thank you for the Marshallese congregation that's a part of this great church. And Lord, I pray that the Marshallese congregation will continue to grow and prosper under the ministry of Pastor Chinta. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for what you're doing. Lord, I pray that you go before Pastor Callis. Prepare the way for him. Open the door for him to be effective in ministry there. Lord, use him mighty. Continue to use him and bless his family. May his needs be provided for. And we thank you. We thank you for him. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Bless him now, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, Pastor Thomas. Hey, remain standing. Let's get into the word. Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to read a passage of Scripture. It's sure been a great joy to be with you today. Thank you for coming and letting me scream at you for a while. Hallelujah. I've missed all of you. I really have. Uh, you've been family to me and my wife for 44 years. And uh, you're still family. And by God's grace, I'll hopefully be able to come visit you at least once a month. And uh, I pray for you. Come on, give praise to the Lord. Would you do it? It's been about four months since I've seen you, so four or five months because of a, heart, uh, a surgery on the heart. But I've got a good word for you, and I'm going to believe that God will use it to bless you. How many came ready to receive from the Lord? Hallelujah. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to Matthew 4. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And listen, just can I say this? Thank you for praying for me. Many of you sent cards, and this morning... Many of you came up just to bless us. Thank you for celebrating our birthdays. We're getting older together. Hallelujah. I remember when I was young. When I came here, I had a mustache and long sideburns and lots of hair. That's all gone now. In, in its place, I got a pop belly, and that's about it. But I'm so thankful. Now, my wife stayed beautiful the whole time, but hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you again for your wanting to bless us. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. 
Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into a high, uh, took him up to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I have given you, if you'll fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light upon our path. Thank you for the joy of allowing me to be with family tonight to minister your word. Come on, people, let's pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment. Spirit of God wants to come upon you, wants to give you a revelation. Spirit of the living God, come, I pray, tonight. Tonight, anoint me to speak your word with clarity, with power that the very things you want said will be said. I pray that you give us ears to hear, a heart to respond, and eyes to see. Lord, give us the revelation we need to live a, such a life that would please you. Oh, God, do it tonight. Flow through us in great measure, and we'll be sure to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What is temptation? Well, I think temptation is an attempt on the part of Satan to take territory, territory that doesn't belong to him. And guess who the territory is? Us. You know, in every sporting event, there's two things that take place. Football's a good example, and I played football in college. You have the offense and you have the defense, and even... I remember the day when you played both sides, but today you've got a whole team that plays defense and a whole team that plays offense. And, of course, we all love to see touchdowns, the offense doing its job. However, if you don't have a good defense, you're going to lose the game. And so it is with our match against the devil. Whether you know it or not, all of us, every one of us, will be tempted. The question is, how do we overcome that temptation? What defense do we operate in that keeps the enemy away? What do we do? How, how does he tempt? What, where does he get into us and do what he does to make us do stupid stuff? Yes, we need a strong offense, but boy, do we need a defense. And I want to talk about Defend yourself in the fight. When you look at this particular passage, you realize that this is a pinnacle moment in the life of Jesus. Sometimes you ask the question, why would he have to go through this? Well, that's a good question to ask. Think about the moment that he does this. It's recorded twice, once in the Gospel of Matthew, once in the Gospel of Luke. Mark tells us, as I mentioned briefly this morning, how it says the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Mark sees this moment as a moment of such urgency that the Spirit of God drove Jesus. He said, well, why, why, why would anybody, why would anybody want to go into a wilderness and fast for 40 days? He had an appointment, <clears throat> and the appointment was to overcome the temptation of Satan. Think about this for just a moment. What happened at the beginning of time? God made Adam and Eve. They were in a perfect world. No needs 
Everything was beautiful. They walked and talked with God. The garden was lush. It wasn't a wilderness. It had everything. You could eat of every tree in the garden except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that garden came a spirit that possessed a serpent. We know that who this entity was in the book of Revelation, the servant is Satan. And Satan came and he tempted Eve. And he tempted Eve, and by tempting Eve, Adam himself was tempted. And they ate the fruit that God said, do not eat, lest you die. Now you think about that. They're perfect beings created perfectly in a perfect universe with no evil. But the result of their disobedience into trying to make themselves God, and make no mistake about it, that same lie is all over our nation today. You're your own God. You can decide what you will. Listen, you can't imagine some of the stupid things people say. Well, what's good for you is good, and what's good for me is good. What they've just said is there's no such thing as truth and everything's opinion. That's what they said. But there is such a thing as truth. Because God exists, and God says this is right and this is wrong. And they failed God. They sinned against him. They yielded to temptation. So if God is going to redeem man and woman, God in forms of flesh, fully God, fully man, fully feeling the temptation, had to come and defeat the enemy in the very realm that Adam and Eve failed in. But no longer was it a beautiful garden. Now it was the playing field of Satan, the wilderness. And now it was a time of fasting, and he was at the very point of starvation. That's why he became hungry. They tell us that when you fast for a period of time, your body begins to give signals. You are starving. If you do not eat, you will die. That was the point. And at his weakest point, Satan comes in to tempt him. Now, I want you to think about this. Every one of us in this room will be tempted. James writes something that we all need to hear. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Don't go blaming God on your temptation, because the Bible says in James, God will not tempt any of us. Satan tempts us. But the way he can win is the awareness that all of us are fallen, all of us yield to temptation, it is kind of like a leaning toward it. And even as a believer, we have to understand there's a war going on in every one of us. There's our fallenness. The Bible calls it our flesh. But if you've come to the Lord, all of a sudden the Spirit of God is now at work in you because God's Spirit makes your spirit alive to God. And He begins to work in you to transform you into the image of Christ. But even in that situation, because of your fallenness, if you're not careful, the enemy will try to stir up something in you. Some failure you had in the past and you kind of revert to it when things are going bad. Some thoughts in your head. Some planting of the devil through various things you've seen or heard. And it stirs you up in your fallen human nature gets a hold of you. Think about the person who's working on the job, a Christian working on the job, but he's short on money. And so he says to himself, oh, I'll just borrow some of the money from the job. No, 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 you're not borrowing. You're stealing. I don't know if you've ever run a business in a place where it's very difficult to find people to work for you that don't steal from you. 
I remember a restaurant manager used to attend our church here years ago, and she mentioned how she had to close the restaurant down. And the reason was, it's a great restaurant doing a great business. But one evening, she decided to go and close up shops. She didn't normally do that. She had other people working for her. When she got there, she saw her employees throwing stakes out to their friends outside the restaurant, throwing away the profits, if you will, of the restaurant. That's theft. And we can all justify it. Oh, I'm lonely. And we justify our immorality. Smile at me, I'm preaching good. <laughs> Every one of us in this room will be tempted at some time or another. The issue is not that you're not going to be tempted. The issue is will you stand? <clears throat> will you stand? You'll notice that if Jesus had failed, there would have been no salvation for humanity. You say, I don't understand. What do you mean? Well, if he had failed at the first temptation, why don't you turn this rocks to bread? He would have never gone to the cross. He would have called angels down from heaven to rescue him. Are you hearing me? The temptation wasn't something that, overcame, that he overcame only once. It was throughout his entire ministry. You say, well, why did he have to do this? Everyone say it with me. He was the second Adam. The first Adam failed. And God in robes of flesh became the second Adam. And he undid everything Adam did to destroy this planet. You'll notice very clearly that when you look at this temptation, you begin to see how the enemy will tempt you and how you can put on a defense that will defeat him. So let's take a look at it. There's three temptations, but they all have volumes of information around them. I have not the time tonight to share it all, but I'll share some things that may help you. The first temptation you'll notice is very fascinating to me because he starts with a statement. If you be the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, think about it for a moment. He Satan couldn't tempt me with that because I couldn't make stones into bread. But Jesus could. He had that power. He was fully human. But he was fully God. But think about what he did, <clears throat> what Satan did when he said, if you be the Son of God. What do you think he was attempting to do in Jesus' mind? Think about it for a moment. Just think, think. Your brain's thinking. Think, think. Can I give you a hint? It starts with a P. Pride. Isn't that the first attack Satan always does? If you're really somebody, you'll do this. Well, I am somebody. <laughs> if you be the Son of God. The first thing that caused Satan to be kicked out of heaven was his pride. And Paul even writes to Timothy about the fact that, listen, be careful when you elevate people into ministry, that you don't elevate them too soon so that they become proud and arrogant and think they're really cool and become victims of the very sin of Satan. If you be... Your identity is not in who somebody else says you are. It is found in Christ alone. You be who God's called you to be. And walk humbly before the Lord. If you be the Son of God, turn these 
stones into bread. You know what the temptation was with self-preservation? You see, Jesus was extremely hungry. He knew he had entered the zone of starvation. But he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You don't yield to the temptation, you fight. And you say, how do I fight, Pastor? I'll tell you how you fight. You fight by coming back to the very nature of why the temptation has even come. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If Satan's trying to do this, I know. But there's a victory even in the fact that the temptation is there if you, dis- if you fight against it. Take your Bibles just to, for a moment and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. I want you to see something because it's fascinating. Start to read at verse 2. Are you, are you with me? And you shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way through these 40 years in the wilderness. Now, look at what it says. To humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, But man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8, 3. But listen to what was said prior to it. That every temptation, God can turn to good. And he can turn to good very clearly by not just delivering you, but revealing to you the necessity to be humble. And secondly, to see what's in your own heart. We don't even see what's in our heart. We have, we, we have not a clue. We just think we're the best thing since sliced bread. That's a Pastor Brian illustration. We just think we're the greatest thing. And, and, and even in a marriage, how could that woman scream at me? I am so wonderful. (laughs) Well, there's been times she had every right to scream at me because I was acting like a jerk. But we're so proud. Sometimes you have to realize you'll go through things in personal relationships that will drive you up the wall. But in those times, if you'll humble yourself, and you'll ask God, God, reveal what's in my heart, you'll find out you're not as perfect as you think you are. That's the truth, honey. (laughs) Oh, I tell you what. And we all have to learn. We all have to learn that. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You say, well, what's Jesus saying here? You overcome the temptation of self-preservation by realizing afresh it's not about you. It's not about your needs. Oh, I've got this need. Oh, grow up. We all have needs. That gives you no right to sin. That gives you no right to break God's law. Oh, you don't understand. I'm so lonely. If you do it God's way, you'll have God's blessing. You do it your way, it'll go to naught. You'll notice the timing of this took place after the baptism of Jesus and identifying with sinful man and the Holy Spirit filling him. Sometimes the enemy will try to attack you early in your walk with God because he knows if he doesn't get you to fail, then you're going to be a problem to him. You know, (laughs) early in my ministry, I learned a lesson that when I was going through a difficult time, not to be discouraged, but begin to be thankful. And I learned it from a friend of mine who said something so profound 
And he was as dumb as I was. I was going through a difficult time. He said, praise God. I said, what? He said, praise God. The devil wouldn't be messing with you unless he knew you were in for a big victory. I said, oh, hallelujah. So when I'm screaming and I'll learn praise God and maybe I'm going through something. <clears throat> but it's the truth. That's why Jesus was attacked in that glorious moment after his baptism and being filled with the Spirit. So don't be surprised. If you're in for victory, the enemy's going to try to rob you of it. Now listen to the fact that in Hebrews 2.18 it says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Think about it. Fully man. He went through everything you've gone through. Think about what it says in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now think about this. Do you know who's going to judge all mankind? It's not the Father. It's Jesus. And why would Jesus be the one to judge all mankind? Because there's no excuse you can use that would give you a pass. None. Oh, I was rejected. <laughs> Jesus was rejected. I was betrayed by my own family. He was betrayed. I suffered. He suffered. I, w I was born on the other side of the tracks. I he was born in a manger in a cave. There's nothing that you can use as an excuse for your sin. Because he went through every situation you've ever gone through. He was abused. He was rejected. A man of sorrows, Isaiah prophesies, filled with grief. He overcame temptation so you could overcome temptation. Because he is in you. And you are in him. So stop being a baby. <laughs> Grow up. Aren't you glad I came to scream at you today? <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. Well, that brings us then to the second temptation. You'll notice <clears throat> that in the second temptation, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you. And <clears throat> in their hands, <clears throat> they shall bear you up, lest you struck a foot against a stone. Now he's quoting Psalm 91. The devil's quoting scripture. He knows scripture better than you. Oh, this guy must be really religious because he knows scripture. He could be of the devil. You have to understand Satan uses scripture to deceive which challenges all of us to know the truth of God's Word. When somebody gives you a scripture, always try to look it up and look for the context by which that scripture is written. What does the whole chapter say? What are the first two chapters before and after say? Do you know what's actually being said? Not what he thinks it's being said. Scripture can speak for itself. And you'll notice that in Psalm 91.1, that same chapter, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In him I 
will trust. Jesus responds very clearly. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. When you read that, you all of a sudden say, why would Satan even use that as a temptation? What was it that the Jews were wanting? He takes them to a high pinnacle. Now, I'm going to tell you where that pinnacle is. If you've been to Jerusalem with us, there's still the courtyard of where the temple built by Herod is. And the, the Kidron Valley is below and there's a place that it's the corner of the temple. It's a high, high wall close to over, oh, I don't know, over a hundred and something feet in the air. It was that point, the highest point of the temple that falls right into that valley. And uh, he takes him there. He says, now jump off because the Bible says you will be protected by the angelic host. Now, what the Jews were looking for was a Messiah that would come out of the sky. They had certain anticipations of their Messiah. It was all wrong because the Messiah came in two ways. One is a suffering servant, which is out of Isaiah, and the second is a conquering king. He will come out of the sky one day as the conquering king, and time will be no more. But you understand something. They, they had it wrong. Now, is Jesus going to do something just to do something sensational to get people's attention? Are you still with me here a moment? Think about that for just a minute. Is he going to do something just because people have an anticipation that that is what he's supposed to do? I get sick and tired. Well, you're a Christian. You're supposed to be doing this. I oh, shut your mouth. <laughs> I know I'm a Christian, but I don't just do something because you think I should. I'm led by the Holy Ghost, and I do what the Lord says. I think about this often. We have to be led by the Spirit. We need to know the Word of God, and we know, need to know the Spirit's voice, and we need to obey Him and not tempt the Lord. I had a friend of mine who I'd known for a while. He had a great church, one of the big churches in a foreign nation. He had a powerful healing ministry. And then the media came to his church and said, look, we want to film one of your healing services because we've heard a lot of people sharing how they got healed here. He said, well, let me pray about it. And he did pray about it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, listen, do not do the service unless these particular things are done. Well, he felt under the pressure to do the service even though those things weren't done. And it ended in a disaster. It almost destroyed his church. And it took many, many years to rebuild it. There's a fine line between faith and presumption. You see, Satan wants to tempt us to be sensational, fulfilling other people's expectations. But the only person we're supposed to fulfill expectations from is the Lord himself. Think about faith, which all of us are called to have. But there is a fine line between faith and presumption. I'll never forget the first big, huge step of faith we took as a church was in 1982. We'd been here on Maui for a year and a half. The church had grown from 100 people to 1,000 people. Today, it's multiple thousands and thousands and thousands of people. 
If you traveled with me to all of our extensions, you'd be amazed at what God's doing. And I remember we couldn't fit in our little chapel even though we tore down the walls. We were in multiple services and there was a skating rink down the street. And every time I drove by, it, 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 I, I saw it. It, it was, it was it's called Maui Skate Palace. It's now a tile store, but back then it was... A ma- and I remember, I remember driving by and seeing in my mind's eye the sign, but it didn't say Maui Skate Palace. It said the name of our church. And every time I drove by, it said the name of our church. In fact, I, I'll never forget it. My wife's a woman of faith. And I said, honey, look at the sign. What does it say? She said... Maui Skate Palace. (laughs) I said, no! (laughs) Well, an opportunity opened for us to move into it. Had to raise a lot of money. And I remember Maud was our treasurer at the time. And we had to come up with a lot of money to put down. They gave us four months to do it. They allowed us to use the building while we were in escrow. But I'm not a professional fundraiser. I didn't have a clue. They don't teach you that in Bible school or anything. In fact, I'd rather just be a person who lets God work on the hearts of people. We couldn't come up with the money. And I went to go see the banker with the owner of the skating rink who we were having to buy the skating rink from. We were going to lease the building, but we had to buy out the skating rink. And I remember sitting with the banker and the banker said to the guy who owned the skating rink, he said, are you willing to keep your name on the loan and uh, allow them to take your place and make the payments? And he said, yes. So I didn't have to come up with the down payment. And we closed escrow. And we had only $80,000. Well, the problem was it was costing us $20,000 a month to be in there. And our income was only 30000 and we were spending 30000 a month. That meant we were 20000 in the hole every month. How many months do you have to be in the hole to be bankrupt? But I had $80,000, and I remember I told Marty, we got four months, and then it's all over. And just like clockwork, bang, 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 four months later, we were down to zero. And we were facing tremendous pressure. And I remember one of the editors of the newspaper came and saw me at my office and said, I hear you're going bankrupt. I said, I don't know about that. I'm not going to confess something like that. But I remember sitting in my office. And it wasn't an office. It was a hole. A stinky hole. And, and they had huge rats in that building. I remember I'm sitting by my desk saying, Oh God, oh God, oh God, was I presumptuous? Did I take a step of faith that wasn't you? Oh God. And this rat comes in. And I knew what he was thinking. You jerk, boy, you're, you're the scum of the earth. You failed. And then God spoke to me. He said, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And he delights in his way. And though he falls, he shall not be cast down, for the Lord shall uphold him with his hand. You're okay, son? I've got this. We were coming to Christmas time, and I didn't know if I was going to have money to pay the staff. And the Lord spoke to me, something I didn't want to hear. When I pastored in California, I was a youth pastor in a church in California, and and the youth ran a tree lot. I hated the tree lot. Because the manager of the tree lot was one of these guys who just drove you like a, uh, you know, a slave, you know, it was... 
And I mean, he'd come knock on my door if I wasn't there all the time. And I'm, I've got other stuff to do. I'm a youth pastor. And I said, Lord, if I ever pastor my own church, I will never <laughs> have a tree lot. It was about in November, and I didn't have money to pay my staff. October, we used up all the money, October, November. I'm praying. The Lord says, open a tree lot. I said, what? <laughs> open a tree lot. Call the guy you didn't like who kept badging you. Ask him where he bought the trees. Open a tree lot. So I ordered trees. We worked our brains out, but we had enough money to make payroll through Christmas. And from that point on, God began to prove himself as my provider. If we hadn't taken the step of faith there, we would have never built this place. Because faith goes from faith to faith. Please listen to me. I know a little bit about faith. I know just a little. But what I do know is that if you succeed in your steps of faith and you pray your brains out, say, Lord, show me what to do. He'll prove himself to you. Take those steps of faith. But be cautious of presumption. Let me share something with you. There was a very famous singer. I knew him because he ministered in one of the events that I uh, sponsored. He had a ranch in Texas, and he had a private airplane. He had a lot of friends over one day, and he said, Let, uh, uh, let's go up in the plane. Well, he packed the plane, and the pilot said to him, he said, look, look this plane is overloaded. You, you, we can't fly. We won't, we won't miss the trees. He said, no, nah, it's okay. They took off, and sure enough, they hit the trees, and they all died. There was a very famous motivational preacher and a great pastor who was flying back to his home city. It was a storm, and the pilot turned to him and said, we can't land. It's too dangerous. He said, no, we're landing. They crashed. They died. I'd been asked to go to Korea to be the keynote speaker of one of the greatest conferences in the world. Pastors from all over the world come. I'm talking pastors that have churches of 250,000. The largest church in America is a Sunday school class compared to some of the churches in our world. The church I was the keynote speaker, I was the largest church in the world, over a million people. I'd never missed a conference in all my 40 years on the board. but I'd had heart surgery. And I remember getting a call from Dr. Remedios, who many of you, he's helped. Well, he's taken a personal uh, concern for me, and he called me. He was so concerned that he flew from Louisiana to my home and came to visit me on a Saturday, the Saturday before I was to go to Korea. He said, I need to check you out. And I'd already made a commitment to the Lord. I said, Lord, if he doesn't give me the approval, I'm not going. I'm not going to be presumptuous. It was a very big decision for me because I've never missed a conference. Well, he checked me out and he said, you know, he said, you can go. Wow, did we have a time. We had some people from here that were there. Who was there? In Korea, that I'll give the Lord a hand for all the things that happened. But I had to learn something between faith and presumption. Don't presume on God. You do what God says. And if it's to take big steps like we did when we built this thing, and when we buy buildings we have no money to buy because we know the Spirit of God has said, go do it. We're not going to back away from it. 
But we're going to ask God, God, show me. Please show me. I do not want to be presumptuous. I'm not doing it for the sensation to be sensational. I'm not doing for the applaud of the crowd. I want your pleasure. I want your approval. I want to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Are you still with me here today? That brings me then to the third temptation. And I bring our message to a close here, just a few minutes. The third temptation, Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give if you will fall down and worship me. Now, how could Satan do that? Well, Jesus made it real clear that Satan is the prince of the air, the ruler of the planet. Jesus mentions that in John 12 and John 14 and John 16. He calls him Satan, the ruler of the planet, ruler of the world. Ephesians 2, 2, the Apostle Paul describes Satan as the prince and power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Satan has the power to offer the kingdoms of the world to people. You can, you can know what I'm talking about. Just look at some of these perverted rock stars who've come out of nowhere and all of a sudden they're making billions of dollars living a lifestyle that is absolutely vile. You say, how in the world could that happen? I'll tell you how it could happen. Satan's raising up somebody that will influence a whole entire generation to be as vile as them. You don't seek wealth and fame. You seek the Lord and let him give you wealth and fame if he plans to do that. I believe God wants to prosper all his people, but you don't seek that. You seek him. He wants influencers in this world. But let him raise you up and elevate you. You do your job and leave the results to him. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, they had dominion of this planet and they gave that dominion to Satan because they believed Satan rather than God. Now listen to how Jesus responds here and why does he respond the way he did? He says, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He commanded Satan to leave. You see the same thing happening when Peter said a satanic inspired word. Remember, it was Peter who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. Here, Peter was used powerfully to reveal who Jesus is. And yet, he had the audacity when Jesus was saying to his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, and they're going to they're, they're kill me. He said, oh, that's not going to happen. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. He knew who was speaking through Peter. Now, if if the enemy can speak through Peter like that, he can speak through you if you're not careful. You don't think the way of God, Jesus said, but of man. Sometimes our perspective on things can be so messed up that we say stupid things. Anybody here ever said something stupid? The rest of you are lying, and you know where liars go. We've all said dumb things. And there's a time when you have to get angry at the devil. Devil, you get out of this place. You speak it forth. You see, Jesus knew that if he compromised with the devil... He no longer would be the sinless lamb that would take away the sins of the world because he would have destroyed and disobeyed the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He knew it. Think about all the things you worship and how that worship of those things can oftentimes replace 
your affection toward God. I live in Texas. What do you know about Texas? Sports. Football. It's the Holy Grail. When the Cowboys don't win, everybody's depressed in Dallas. <laughs> and half the nation is depressed. Let's look at that. See, he's got a cowboy shirt on right now. <laughs> That's all right. I enjoy watching him. But the point of the matter is you can make a God of anything. We have a whole generation making a God of wealth and fame and illicit sexuality. I mean, we even compromise on who a man is and who a woman is because of the sins and the perversion of our world. We've worshipped sex. It's an evil thing. It was meant to be good, and it is good in the confines of the way God meant it to be. To bring a man and a woman together for a lifetime commitment, to raise a family, to love each other and to love those children, and to love God. But we've distorted it. We've worshipped it. And it's a very sad thing. Are you still with me here? Think about what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to compromise with the devil. He came to destroy the works of the devil. You're not here on this planet to see how many friends you can make and how much you can get as close as you can to the kingdom of darkness without sinning. That's stupid. You have already messed up. Are you still with me? You've already messed up because you're flirting with temptation. And you flirt with temptation to see how strong you are. You're stupid. You get rid of temptation. You get as far away from it as you can. Somebody say amen. End this message. My nose is running. And I got to chase after it. Satan was offering Jesus an easy way to fulfill the expectation of Israel for Messiah. He wasn't going to take the easy way, and you shouldn't either. You do what God says. You do what God says. I'm so glad God called me to Maui. When I came, I had pastor friends of mine saying, you're crazy. It's the, it's the death knell of all pastors. Every pastor who's ever gone to Maui has failed. It's not going to be what you think it's going to be. But I knew what God said to me. He was going to build a great church here. And he's done it. And he receives all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Well, i got to end this. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. But one of the great things at the end of that passage, he says, you will be rewarded. There's nothing you ever give up for God that he won't reward you. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And he has remorded, rewarded me many times over, allowing me to be your pastor. And to allow my family to be raised in this church who can carry on the ministry of this house. They have the DNA. It oozes out of their pores. I don't have to worry about them. Now, they got unique ideas, and I sometimes worry about that. <laughs> but that's all right. God, God says, I got it. I got it. It's okay. It's going to work. Don't worry about it. You've done your part. Let them do theirs. I'm so thankful that all of my children are carrying on the ministry that God in his graciousness gave to my wife and I. I thank him for it every day. 
Sometimes we need to lose our life in order to find it. Sometimes we need to take steps of faith that are difficult. Sometimes we need to do some things that we don't really get too excited about. But if we'll obey the Lord, he'll turn it into something great. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, I'm done. <laughs> Some of you say. Did you get help tonight? Did you get help? <clears throat> you got anybody in this house who's going to bring on a great defense against the powers of darkness? And you're going to win. You're going to win. You're going to win over every temptation. God does not want you to fail. That's why he told us, pray, lead us not into temptation. He doesn't bring any temptation your way that you cannot overcome. Maybe you're going through some things tonight and the enemy's been banging at your head, giving you all kinds of stupid thoughts and you've been into entertaining. Or maybe you just, you feel frustrated and you don't even know why you're frustrated. Could it be the enemy's trying to rob you of the joy? I want to pray for you tonight. But before I pray for you, I want to pray for every person who may be here tonight who's never given their heart to Jesus. I want every head bowed just for a moment in respect to the work of the Holy Spirit in this house. You'd say, Pastor Morocco, I, uh, I'm not really sure that if I were to die today, I'd go to heaven. I don't know if my sins are forgiven. I, I hope they are. No, the Bible says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want tonight to be my night where I affirm my faith in Jesus Christ and make him the Lord of my life. Pastor, pray for me. If that be you, would you slip up your hand right now quickly? Yes, 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 yes. Are there others? Don't want to miss anyone. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, back there. God bless you. Yes, so many have raised their hands. Look at me just a second. I'm not here to embarrass anyone. But if we were having a wedding ceremony and the bride walks down the aisle, it's not a time of embarrassment. It's a time of celebration. And I'm going to invite every one of you that raised your hand to celebrate the fact that the Holy Ghost reached out to you and said, come home. As we worship the Lord, would you step out right now? If you raised your hand, and even if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you need to get right with God, would you meet me right down here? We're going to pray together. Would you come? People are coming. Would you come with them? you join me in the word of prayer and we're not going to pray alone I'm going to have the entire congregation pray with you because all of us need to affirm our faith in Jesus you may have slipped a little bit in your relationship with God this can be the time of coming home would you lift your hands with me because the Bible says whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved would you pray this right out loud and say, well, you know, I've prayed it many times. Pray it again. Because somebody standing by you may be encouraged by your prayer. Would you pray right out loud these words? Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I repent for my past deeds. Even the things I said. And I choose to follow you. Jesus, Jesus. Come, into my life. 
Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my King. I surrender all that I am to you. And I will serve you from this day on. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Leave your hands raised for just a moment. Just leave your hands raised. Begin to pray. Hope. Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. Fill my life with your power. Holy Spirit, come in power. Across this auditorium, filling people with your power, Lord, that they can live for you every day of their life. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Put a hunger deep in every heart for more and more and more of you. Now I want every person that says, Pastor, this message is for me. I'm going to stand strong against the power of temptation. I'm going to be an example to my family and my friends that we can live right for God in the midst of a dark world. If that be you, step out from where you're standing. Come stand here. Join these precious folk here in the front. Would you come? Come on. Sing that again. Higher than Lots of people are coming. Come real close. Come. Let my life to your lift your hands with me. Lord, I thank you for everyone that's standing here. We can't make it on our own. You never intended us to. You said you would be with us. In those conversations at home or on the job or in situations that seem so difficult, you said there would be no temptation that would come our way that you wouldn't provide a way of escape. Father, I'm asking for these, that whatever they're going through now, that they will stand strong and be a testimony of your grace and mercy to everyone around them. And use them mightily for your glory, honor, and praise. People just pray in the Holy Ghost a moment. The peace of God is coming upon people. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Give peace to those that are frustrated. Give peace to those whose minds wander. Give peace, O oh God, to those who are sleepless at night and cannot rest. Give them peace, O oh God, the peace that passes all understanding. And I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name. I'll be here Wednesday night to listen to Jesse Duplantis. He's been coming here since we were under a tent on Connie Street. I knew Jesse before people knew Jesse. <laughs> and I'm so thankful that he's coming. I hope you'll bring your friends and family to come once and I'll be here. And then I fly on Thanksgiving Day in the evening. I'll fly to Alaska and I'll preach at our church in Alaska all day. Then I'll fly from Alaska to to Dallas and preach there, and then I'll fly to Missouri and preach there. I'll fly to uh, West Virginia and preach there as well. And um, I'm not doing what I did in previous years where I had banquets every day for two or three weeks. My staff said, Pastor, this isn't the time for that. You need to rest. So instead, I'm just preaching my brains out on Sundays. <laughs> Would you pray for me? Yes. Please do. And I'll keep you in prayer. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Take somebody by the hand as we close. Pastor Colleen, I like it when you pray. Come on up here. Take this microphone. You're sure, you're sure a wonderful lady. You know, I was so excited about transformation. 
that was your heart. You were a woman of faith. Would you pray for these fine folk? Thank you, Father, that you have come to meet with us tonight. May each person, Lord, as they leave, not leave the same way they came in, but know that they have encountered oh God. 